Good morning. We're so glad you're here. Let's stand up together. Good morning. Hey, before you have a seat, turn to a couple people and just say, Happy Easter.
ministry fair. It's going to be outside, weather permitting. And this is going to be a time where you've all been to like career fairs and stuff, right? Where there's different stations you can go to for information. That's what this is going to be like. So you'll be able to learn about different ministries that we have here at the next chapter. And you can volunteer for some. So at that point in time, you know, be praying about it. Maybe you're being led to a ministry and you'll get to hear about different opportunities there. I'll tell you about some other ones, though, coming up here in just a second. And you don't have to sign up, right? I don't think we're doing sign-ups. No, just yeah. be there. Just be there. There will be food. We don't know what the food is yet, but there will be food, and it should be good. So stick around three weeks from today, Sunday, April 30th. Next Tuesday, you have the opportunity to... How many of you have been to a quarter auction? Let me just start there. Quarter auctions? Okay. Here's the thing. You don't have to have a bunch of quarters. This is not the time to go find all of the quarters that you have in your house, okay? You also don't have to go to a bank in advance and get quarters. You can come to the quarter auction, and they will give you quarters there. But it's really fun, a great fun time to connect with other people from Next Chapter. All of the proceeds are coming back to the church, and so I know we've already gotten some baskets together, and it's going to be really fun. So you can get there at 5.30, as early as 5.30, but it starts at 7. And you can come early and eat and, you know, get ready, get warmed up, get your paddles ready. That's, you use paddles. Anyway, um, so that is not going to be here, though. Really important that you know that. Do not come here. You need to go to the Newport Elks Lodge in Cold Spring. Okay, if you don't know where that is, we can help you, right? But don't come here, Newport Elks Lodge, Cold Spring, next Tuesday, April 18th. And we hope to see you there. Next Sunday... April 16th, 16th, yeah, halfway through April already next week. What's that about? Anyway, we're going to have a new attenders lunch. So if you have been, if you've come to a five-minute meetup or maybe you never even have, um, but you're like, hey, I want to learn more, come to the new attenders lunch. We would like for you to sign up so we do have food and lunch, enough lunch, right, for this one. And so it's just an opportunity to be able to learn more about next chapter. So please come to that. And next week also, we are starting Next Gen in the AM. So bless you, Cecily. Um, I'm not going to ask how many of you are 6th or 12th graders because you wouldn't want to raise your hand. I get it. I have one myself. I see some of you older gentlemen raising your hand. This is actual age. Okay. So um, you can volunteer, though. This is a way that you can do ministry. So you can volunteer to help with Next Gen. Um, and so we're going back to Next Gen in the AM. That's going to be during service. And so we'll actually be asking all our 6th through 12th graders if they want to participate in that next week. So look for more information on that next week that is going to be starting. We also have a new life group starting this Tuesday, April 11th on spiritual gifts. How many of you feel like you know what your spiritual gift is? Just a quick show of hands. Okay. Okay, good. Those of you that know, you can still come because you can help other people, right, in understanding their spiritual gifts. Um, but this is a great opportunity to learn what your spiritual gift might be if you don't know. And we all have them. So if you're like, oh, shoot, I better not come because what if I find out I don't have any, right? You do. You do. And so please come. Um, we would like for you to sign up if possible, and you can always register for anything that requires signups online or through the app. But that's going to be starting this Tuesday at 630, and that's going to be in our connection room, in our connection room right back here. So um, please sign up for that if you are interested. And then next week we're starting a new series on... Love, marriage, and singleness. This relates to everybody, right? If you're like, oh, I see the word marriage, doesn't pertain to me. Well, you're probably single, okay? So it relates to you, relates to all of us. This is only a two-week series, so we're going to pack a lot into these two weeks. So please come the next two weeks to learn more about what the Bible tells us about living married or single. So um, what God intends for our relationships. Those are all the announcements I have. That's a lot of announcements. Yeah, it was very exciting. And I'm going to lead us into offering now. Um, so with offering, there are several ways that you can give. You can give online, through the app, through text. We'll show you the text on the next screen that you can text during service. And we'll bring some baskets around as well. And so I'm going to lead us in prayer. And then we're going to continue worshiping together on this beautiful Easter morning. Jesus, thank you so much. 
Thank you is not enough for what you've done for us, for dying so that we can be forgiven, so that we can live free, so that really we can be your image to the rest of the world, so that we are able to reflect you and to everyone around us. You are living today. You've been living every day of our lives right around us, so we don't have to wait for you to come. You're already here. And so may we just remember that the most we can reflect your light is just like a body of water that can reflect the most beautifully when it's still and calm and peaceful and reflecting your love. And so let us be that same reflection to others as we go about our day, as we go about our week, as we go about the rest of the month and the rest of our lives. It's in your name we pray. Amen.
at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter. I was an orphan. You call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing.
shout hallelujah Father God, we thank you that you hold the entire world in your hands, that you hold our individual lives in your hands, that you are the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, that you have this beautiful plan for grace and forgiveness given to us through your son Jesus. And as we celebrate that sacrifice and his resurrection this morning, we ask that in new wonderful ways you would reveal bits of your truth and your love to each and every one of us at the point of our need. We ask this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. You guys can have a seat. Amen. He is risen. Y'all, that's good. Yes. Good to see everybody. Hey, I, I don't know if there'll be more coming in. And I hate to ask you because I know as humans, we don't like to do anything that we already done. So if you can squeeze in a little bit, if just to save some room, if you're willing to do that, great. No one's going to make you do that. I don't know if there'll be more coming, but if they do, it's really late and we'll just look at them like, what are y'all so late here for? Uh, just kidding. Hey, um, great to see y'all. Man, I, I think one of the beautiful parts of Easter, it could be painful too, is um, even in the midst of brokenness, uh, that we get to be a family. And for some of us, maybe that's not a great idea. For others of us, it is. And uh, I'm just so thankful. Um, my son Jackson surprised me. He's in Chicago, and he came in this morning walking down. I'm like, Jackson? <laughs> so it's so good to have him here with me and his buddy and my nephews and my sister-in-law and brother-in-law. And then my daughter Taylor came from Austin, Texas this weekend. So it's just, yeah, so I'm very, thank you for letting me just share. I'm excited to have my family here with him. Uh, his name was Garvey. And then, uh, I think Kennedy, yes, Kennedy. <laughs> oh no, She's Dr. Like, oh, yeah, Ryan, right. this is right. what I was talking about. Where did you go? Yeah, she gets, so and Kennedy all the way from Lexington, Kentucky. She came here. She's here. That's right. And it's so good. I, I know that some of you are with family too. I know Beatrice's mom and dad are here. Wave your arms. Hand where's your, yeah, the dad, there he is. Where'd they go? So what's that? Oh, sorry, I missed something. But it's good to see a lot of family, too. And, uh, yeah, thanks for being here this Easter. Uh, I thought it would be fun to start with a joke or two. Oh, here we go. Yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, okay. <laughs> I, may be going, I may be going against my better judgment. I have one's a little more risque than the other one. Can you all handle the truth? Can you handle the truth? Yeah. Put, your, put your adult pants on, okay? This is a true story, but it's kind of cute. It's a true story. There was a pastor in a service, and you know how they used to do the children's message? All the kids come down. He was saying, kids, it's Easter Sunday. Do you all, <laughs> don't just have grace on me. He said, kids, it's Easter. Easter second guessing. <laughs> it's Easter Sunday, kids. Do you all know what the resurrection means? And one little boy brought his hand. True story. He says, I'm not totally sure. But I know if you have a resurrection longer than four hours, you should call the doctor. <laughs> but yeah, thank you, thank you. Oh, man. <laughs> Can you explain that? <laughs> I'm I very can't confused. explain it. Kids, ask your parents. That'll be great. They would love to talk to you about that. The other one is much more church related. Uh, the other one is uh, there was a, a husband and his wife and his mother in law. They were going and traveling the Holy Land in Israel. And um, unfortunately, this is a joke. This is not a true story. Unfortunately, the mother-in-law, the grumpy, complaining mother-in-law passed away. The undertaker there in the Holy Land said, hey, listen, we can ship her body back for $5,000 or she can just be buried here for $150. The, the, the son-in-law thought, he's like, uh, go ahead and ship her body back to the States. He said, you want to ship her back for $5,000 instead of burying her here in this beautiful place for $150? He said, yeah, he said, a man 2,000 years ago resurrected from the dead, and I can't take that chance. <laughs> so all you mother-in-laws, it's a joke, it's a joke. Your son-in-laws love you. Uh, 
We got a lot to cover this morning. I hope uh, I can make sense of it and go quickly, but it's such good stuff. I will say this before I pray and get going. Um, I think for all of us, I, I love all gathering together because if we were to hear everybody's story, we would all have different stories for sure, but different takes on God. Maybe you wouldn't, you would have no take on God. I, I don't know, but I'm glad you're here. I'm glad we're all here. I'm glad I'm here. But I know one thing is true. We all tell ourselves a narrative of some sort. Either we believe that this life is over at death and boom, that's it. Some believe that. Or you believe because of the resurrection, life does not end this way. It will be the glorious hope that we all long for in our hearts. You know, the, the older I get, the more I realize there are things in our spirit that we crave. And it's only a craving because God has put it there. So for instance, just very practical things, we crave air, our lungs need air. And so God has made it though there's air to breathe, constantly good air. Uh, we, we get hungry. Our bodies crave food, that's not by accident. That's why there is food and good food. Um, and this one, we, we crave, I'm not trying to be funny, but we crave sex and thankfully there's beautiful sex in the right context of marriage, there's beautiful sex. Our bodies crave that. So it is with so much that we crave, we crave for the world to just be loving. There's a reason you crave that. There's a reason when people die, it hurts so much because we weren't supposed to die like that. I know uh, this week, I don't think she'll mind Jen, I think Michelle uh, sent, uh, j their, their father passed away about eight years ago, which stinks because I really would have loved to have gotten to know him and be with him. Um, but I know just looking at his picture this week, Jen just had some moments of teariness because it's just so weird. Death is so bizarre. Why is that? Because it's not supposed to be that way. So there's lots of things, and I'm so excited that Easter is what makes everything make a little more sense for our spirits. And if it wasn't for Easter, as we mentioned several series ago of the Bible, if it wasn't for Easter, there would be no Bible. There would be no Christian faith. There'd be nothing. Jesus would be just a footnote in history as a good teacher. But it is this one event of Jesus rising from the dead and people who witnessed it and wrote it down and gave us the gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And they, they talked to other people that witnessed Jesus come back. Hundreds of people saw, Easter, saw Jesus rise from the dead. And so it's this event of Jesus rising from the dead. I love one of the songs we said that something about impossible. And I can't remember the verse right off, but it said that um, Jesus rising from, it was impossible for Jesus not to rise from the dead. Why is that? Because the love of the Father would not allow that. It was impossible for Jesus to stay dead because God is love. And so this morning, if you don't have a narrative where Jesus rises from the dead and all things that we desire at some point will come to fruition, that's my prayer, my goal today, that you would be open to that. For others of us, I hope it's an encouragement. Let's pray together and then, uh, gosh, I've already talked enough. I'm tired of hearing myself talk, but well, I'll talk some more in it nonetheless. All right, let's pray. God, we thank you for this day. Thank you for all these beautiful people who are here that you have created and designed, and you have a purpose for each person that sits here and listens online. Father, we need your Holy Spirit to open our minds and hearts today. And Father, I just pray that you would have your way and your truth would be revealed to us and that we would see you as the beautiful God that you are. Take away all the lies and the deceptions that the enemy throws at us. May we just be open to you today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to jump right. You all ready? We got to go quick, all right? Okay. Nobody's ready, but we're going. Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, Paul says this. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel that he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. 
All that to say is the resurrection confirms that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and the Lord of Lords. It is the resurrection that confirms that Jesus is who he said that he was. I think the other thing that's really interesting is the disciples, those that follow Jesus, when Jesus was arrested and crucified, they all ran away, denied him, left him, abandoned him. Um, but then on Sunday morning, when the ladies heard that Jesus had been resurrected, they tell the, the disciples, after that, they were these bold evangelists. What changed from being a bunch of cowards to being bold evangelists? It was the resurrection of Jesus. Many of them would go on to lose their life in terrible ways because of the resurrection of Jesus. Some of them would be stabbed to death, would be burned, to lo- burned alive, would be beheaded, would be crucified. They did all that. Why would they do that? Because there was the resurrection of Jesus. So this morning, what I really want to cover, and again, say with me, what I really want to cover is why did Jesus have to die? If you've ever thought about that, why did Jesus have to die? And why is that significant to me 2,000 years later? Why is that important? Well, let me take you a little bit back in time. When, when I was growing up, I'm not saying this was wrong. I just, I want to bring some color to this. I, I want to expand on this. But when I was growing up, kind of the evangelical viewpoint of the purpose of Jesus going to the cross was this. There's a holy God, which God is holy, and he cannot stand sin, can't look upon sin. But there's a dilemma because God, on the other hand, loves sinners. So what's a God to do? You can't look at sin, but you love sinners. Well, in in this view of what I grew up in, the evangelical view, the father instead would vent his holy wrath on Jesus instead of venting his holy wrath on me and you to suffer eternally. So Jesus would take on our guilt and our punishment. The wrath of the Father was vented upon Jesus, which then would allow us to be welcomed in and loved and be seen as righteous. So the resurrection view, kind of what I grew up in that era, is that the sacrifice of Jesus was adequate to satisfy God's wrath against sin. Doggone it. But here's, here's where I want to include, here's where I want to expand that. If, that is the, if that's the view of God, then God had to punish Jesus to let us off the hook. That seems weird. I don't know if it seems weird to you. It seems weird to me, which means that paganism oftentimes had it right because they would sacrifice things to appease the gods. So God needed a sacrifice. Someone had to die, so Jesus would die. But it seems like an odd thing. Um, Jesus would go on to tell us that, hey, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. Jesus was the perfect revelation of the Father. So if the view was God can't look at sin, if you look at Jesus' life who revealed God, Jesus was always with the sinners. He was with the prostitutes. He was with the tax collectors. Nobody had to be sacrificed before he hung out with them. So if that's true, that God can't stand sin, and God doesn't, God, sin hurts everybody. But if, if that's the case, then Jesus wouldn't have been hanging out with all these sinners, and he did. See, I think God's holiness is not some prissy, prudish, I got to be really good like the Pharisees. God's holiness, the word holiness, holy means to be set apart. The set apartness of God is that he is unlike any other God, that he would leave his throne in heaven, become a man, take all of the sin and the curse on us out of his love for us, and then give us a hope for eternity. That's what makes him holy. That sets him apart than any other God in the world. So that's much different. Thank you, Alan. I'm glad somebody's listening to me. Uh, and so I'll just get it. Uh, so that's it. Here's the other thing. In this view of God and the view of salvation, forgiveness never really gets, it's not really forgiveness. It's um, someone's paying a price so that I can get off scot-free. So it'd be like if Colin owed me a debt of $1,000 and say, Colin, you owe me $1,000. If you don't pay, I'm going to put you in prison. And someone says, hey, I'll pay his debt. So someone, Robbie gives me $1,000, then Colin's off the hook. But did I really forgive Colin's debt? No, because Robbie paid me. So in this view of things, it's kind of weird. Um, it's kind of weird. In, in the fact of, think if God forgave like this. Children, I want you to forgive as I have forgiven. So if you hurt me, 
Some, Jackson hurt me. You're, someone's going to pay for that. I, I'm going to forgive you like that. Someone's got to pay so that I can, you can be forgiven. And so it's not a very good view of forgiveness. The fourth thing is this. It puts violence in the center of the Christian story. And I think that's so dangerous. God's got to appease his wrath so someone's going to die. Jesus, Jew. And all through history, this wasn't the original century view of why Jesus died. It only came in the 10th and 11th centuries that people began to think there had to be someone had to pay the wrath of Jesus and God was going to kill him. The problem is when you start doing that, it wasn't long after that the Crusades came about. Christians in the name of God, killing Muslims, killing other Christians in the name of God, thinking they were being righteous. And you look at Jesus, he's not a violent God. He gives his, remember Peter? Peter was like, Lord, I'll take care of you. I'm going to slice this guard and cut his ear. And Jesus healed the guard's ear in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus gave his life up. He wasn't a violent God. What Jesus shows us on the cross is a beautiful, loving God. And then the last thing, 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 19 says this. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. I love this part. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sin against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Do you get what Jesus did on the cross? God is no longer holding your sin against you. So you quit holding it against yourself. He came to reconcile us back to himself. And so that wasn't the only thing that God was reconciling. He wasn't reconciling himself to himself. He was reconciling the world to himself. God didn't have the problem. God didn't have the dilemma. The world had a problem. And God came because we were dead, we were estranged, we needed reconciling. So Christ on the cross reconciled us, but not just us. In my view of growing up, it was just about humans. But do you realize, this will help some of you, some of you are like, man, I'm more spiritual than I thought. Do you realize that our original command was to have dominion over the earth and the animal kingdom? So for those of you who love animals, that's a God-given thing in you. When we see animals suffer, do you realize what that does to you? Because our original mandate was to, was to love as God loved both one another and the, the earth and animals. And that's not a political statement. Please, oh gosh, Rob must be liberal. I'm not, not, that has nothing to do with it. That was the original command. And so, and so creation as a whole is also needing redeeming, not just humans. So look at this. This is really interesting stuff. Romans 8, 18 through 19. Paul says this, which is a great word to us today. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Paul is saying, now these weren't some Pollyannish pie in the sky people. But he said this. I know what you're going through is a lot. Some of us, there's a lot going on in our community right now. And it's heavy stuff and it's sad stuff. And it's hurtful stuff, and we grieve. So never take that lightly. But Paul says that those sufferings that you're suffering, they have no, they have nothing comparable to what is in store for us. So keep your faith on that. Then he goes on to say, for the creation waits an eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. Not only do we wait, but creation waits. Look what this one, ladies, you all will uh, identify with this. Romans 8, 22 through 23. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the spirit, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. He's saying the whole creation is not functioning like it was intended to. And even creation is groaning like labor pains. Ladies, let me hear what that sounds. I'm just kidding. So you, uh, if you've been through labor, you know 
I've not experienced that, so have grace on me. You know that it's one of the most horrific pains you can experience. Think about that. Creation is groaning. Not only that, but our bodies are groaning. Can I get an amen? Some of our bodies. Our bodies are breaking down. We get illnesses. We get viruses. We get things happen to us. That's not of God. Creation, us, we all are broken. We're in need of reconciling. So how did, how did we get into this situation? How is it that creation is groaning and we're groaning and everybody's groaning for this reconciliation of God? Now, what I'm going to share, for some people, this is hard to accept. That's okay. Just keep praying and, and searching and studying yourself. Um, but I want to say, from the very beginning, God created, God always creates out of love. God is love. So when you create something out of love, um, you want to share in that. God's a relational God, so God wants to share. God will also give empower power and authority because he wants to share. So when God originally created, he created the spiritual beings, and he shared out of his love. He shared his authority and his power to these spiritual beings. Because God is love, love always has to have, um, it, it's not demanding, it's not, you can't, you can't make someone love you. There's a free will involved. So even the spiritual beings have a free will. And so God, out of his love, created all these things and gave them authority over different realms. And so the problem is that Satan and a lot of the angels were cast out of heaven because they kind of started a rebellion. With their power and authority, guess where they start wreaking havoc? In our world, in our creation. You don't have to believe that. I believe it. Jesus believes it. And, and so just listen to this. Um, all of a sudden, nature is not what it was supposed to be. It's not what it's originally intended. Tornadoes, hurricanes, killing people, that's not of God. How do, if you don't believe in the spiritual realm, how do you justify all that stuff? I can't. But Jesus believed in a real figure of Satan and demonic powers and authorities and principalities. Um, in the early church, it was their viewpoint. When things of nature happened, diseases happened, illnesses happened, um, Famines happen, tornadoes happen, whatever. They knew it wasn't an act of God. They knew it wasn't God's will. They knew an enemy had done this. An enemy had done this. But one of our jobs from the very beginning when God created us was to partner with God to have dominion over the earth and create it as God's will is in heaven. To lovingly have dominion over the earth in the animal kingdom. But when Adam came along and Eve and our ancestors they rebelled against God like they, and they succumbed to all of that, and they surrendered all of our authority and a power to them. Why is our world so broken? There's a lot of spiritual stuff going on that's not of God. We are a royal mess. The Bible doesn't give us a rosy picture of our world. Let me, let's, let me go through just real quick what Jesus called Satan or Lucifer, or the morning star, or the father of lies, the deceiver, the accuser. He says this, Jesus says three times, you'll see the passages listed, that he is the prince of this world. Jesus says that Satan is the ruler of this world. He's the boss of this world. Then he says the ruler, he's the ruler of the kingdom of the air, which is just another way to say that he has spiritual authority over the earth. Then he says the God of this age, Satan is the God of this age. Then he says he's the evil one who controls the entire world, which might be a little exaggeration. I think the point is that he controls a lot. And then he says the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. That's all he does. When you see stuff on the news around you, it's, 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 demonic. it's not of God. Then he says he's the one who has the power of death which tells us that death is an alien intruder into our world. I don't believe that's what God intended from the original creation. But now all of a sudden, 
The original creation it produces cancer, not designed by God. There's corruption. We are spiritually oppressed. And the bad news is we are all screwed up, jacked up, busted up. The world is broken, corrupt, polluted, tainted. The world is full of pain and suffering. We're born into this world of pain and suffering, and we're all broken in many ways. We know this. We know this. We're broken physically, our bodies, we feel it daily. The older you get, you know, it's not supposed to be that way. Illnesses, diseases, aging, not supposed to be that way. We're born with physical abnormalities. Mentally, we're broken. We can get healthier, but it takes a lot of intentionality. Our brains are self-centered and self-righteous. I heard this analogy, I loved it. Being self-righteous, we all have to fight against that. God says, don't be self-righteous. You got a big old two by four in your eye and you're looking at the speck of dust in your brother's eye? Quit doing that. It's like two dead corpse arguing about who's deader. That's the analogy. Isn't that funny? That's what we do. When we're self-righteous and judgmental, you, you stink more. You, you've been deader longer. Well, no, you stink. You're dead too. Neither one of them are qualified for life, but they're comparing who's deader. That's what we do. Like, we're all broken. We're in this broken world. And Jesus says, when you start judging people, you sound like, he doesn't say this really, you sound like two corpses trying to decide who's more fit for life. You're both broken. You know, this isn't in my notes. One of the things, I'm going to brag on my nephews here of, um, of Brennan and Luke. One of the things that I've seen in you guys that I love is um, I've never seen them be judgmental of other people. They might be in their mind. But I never see it play out that way. Matter of fact, I hear them sticking up for people. That's what God's kingdom looks like. But we're all broken, and so we all have this self-righteous, this uh, judgmental stuff to us. And Paul says we're all dead in sin. That doesn't mean we're as evil as we can possibly be. It just means that I am so broken, I cannot fix myself. I'm so broken, I need a savior. You're so broken, you can't fix yourself. The world's so broken, you, they can't, it can't fix it. We need a savior. And thankfully, his name is Jesus. Why did Jesus have to die? He reveals this God who's a different kind of God, who has a different kind of love, who swears off all violence. He's a God who's on everyone's side. It's not an us versus them God like so many gods are. He's a God for all people. It's a beautiful, he's a beautiful God. And on the cross, we see what God is really like. And on the cross, the deceiver has been defeated. I think what's really interesting in our world, the deceiver, Satan, the deceiver, he deceives us all the time by telling lies about who God is and we believe him. He tells lies of who God is, and we believe him, because if we believe him, it keeps us from getting close to God, the one who loves, loves you. So the cross revealed that God is not holding our sin against us. Paul says it's been nailed to the cross, and it's been erased. And it's not back to the evangelical view when I grew up. It's not God saying every sin must be punished that would be Satan saying that. And it's not God saying, I need some blood for this stuff. That's not God. That's Satan. I think we get God and Satan confused sometimes because God's love covers a multitude of sin and it blows away condemnation and guilt and shame. And we are allowed to live by grace instead of fear. But it raises a good question. Well, Rob, that sounds good. But if the powers of darkness um, have been defeated, why haven't they been defeated? Good question. If we've been so liberated, why haven't we been liberated? And this is based on kind of what I'm going on and what I study and what best I have is I've heard it's a great paradox of the already and not yet. Victory has already, Jesus has already won the victory. He is already won and defeated. Why did Jesus have to die? to defeat the powers and authorities and principalities that have held us captive. He died for that. And he was able to set us free and not hold our sins against us and restore us. But 
It hasn't happened in its fullness yet. It has already happened, but we don't see it fully played out like our souls and spirits de desire for it. And so um, I've heard this example. It's like a seed. It's almost like a seed has been planted. Jesus has already won the victory over Satan and all the demonic forces and has liberated us. And it's a seed that's been planted in the ground and it's a seed of liberation. And it's just a matter of time before it's fully manifested. When Jesus comes back, we don't know when that will be. But we know when Jesus comes back, it will be fully manifested. So all of the hate will be gone. All of the racism will be obliterated. All of the walls that separate people will be gone. Death will not be the end. That's the beauty of the resurrection. But it hasn't been manifested fully yet. That's why the authors are always saying in scriptures, don't lose faith. Don't lose hope. I know it looks like it's Good Friday and Good Friday always wins. But the seed has been planted and it has already been defeated. When Jesus comes again, it will fully be manifested. And let that be our narrative. Let that be our narrative. That Jesus has come, and he's come to obliterate all the powers and authorities and principalities so that he could set us free. Jesus rose from the dead so that you will rise from the dead. He conquered sin and death so that you would be victorious over sin and death and the grave. Everything that is wrong will be right. Our spirits long for that. Everything that is wrong that will be right, all, all things that are broken, they will be restored Pain will be eradicated from this world. The source of all evil has been eradicated and will all just be the only thing that will permeate in this world is the perfect love of God. But here's the thing. You and I have a role to play in this thing. See, it's easy to look like the darkness has won and still wins. And evil will always be around. But as people that follow Jesus, he says, I'm giving you the power, the same power that, that the Father raised me from the dead, I'm giving to you. And I'm saying, would you rejoin me in the original design of have dominion over this earth? And would you push back the darkness? Would you help, would you help eliminate some of the darkness by living as I lived, as my son lived, and know that no matter what you go through, and it might be horrendous, it will be horrendous, that that's not the final word. The final word is Jesus has won, and it will be fully manifested someday if you believe it. And so that's the beauty of Easter. If it wasn't an Easter, I, I would be a very bitter, cynical man. If, life, if this is all there is, count me out. This is miserable. Parts of it are not, but when I look around me, it is. But just know that the reason Jesus came was to obliterate all that our spirits are against. So will you join him in that? He has a purpose for you. That's your purpose. Your purpose is to go and to make this world look more like God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for your promises. Thank you for your hope. Thank you for the glory that has already taken place and what will take place. Father, I know you said no eye has seen, no ear has heard what you have in store for those who love you. So God, give us an extra measure of faith this morning that we would believe this and live and align our lives to this truth. And church, it starts with having a relationship with Jesus. I love that God doesn't hold our sins against us. We just have to receive that truth. It starts with being in a relationship with Jesus. If you have never totally surrendered your life over to Jesus, today on this Easter would be a great day to do it. Out of his love, he wants to set you free. 
If you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, never turned the steering wheel over to God, today would be a great day. And if you would say, Rob, yeah, today I've never received the forgiveness and love of Jesus, but I want to today. If you've never done that, but you want to start a relationship with Jesus today, if you would, would you just lift up your hand so I can see and pray for you? If not, no big deal. But if you're like, Rob, I want to accept this Jesus today on this Easter, this love and forgiveness, just raise your hand. Yeah, I'm going to pray. And then for the rest of us, may we uh, take up the invitation to do this thing with God. To live out his will on earth as it is in heaven. Father, I pray for those who want to give their life over to you today, Father. I just pray that you was, they would just in their own heart and mind accept your forgiveness and grace based on what Jesus did on the cross that forgives them and cleanses them. And God, I pray that you would help restore them and restore and renew all the broken areas in their life physically, emotionally, and spiritually. God, may they come to know you today and start on this journey of partnering with you to bring your kingdom on this earth. Father, for the rest of us, I pray that we'd get a renewed vision of being part of your body and looking like your son Jesus in the way that we live. Help us to do that, God. Help us to push against the darkness. Help us to know that we've already been given the victory and someday we will see it in its entirety. Until then, thank you. Forgive us your Holy Spirit so that we can live abundantly now. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for hanging in there. Someone said in the last service, like, boy, you were long-winded today, weren't you? And I said, well, do I need to cut some? I'm, I don't know. Is it too long? Um, but, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Alan, you're my man today. Thanks, man. Um, there'll be prayer ministers on the sides of the, of the stage. If you want to come forward for prayer, if you raise your hand or if you want to know how to come into a relationship with Jesus, they'd love to talk with you about that. Um, if you need prayer for anything, prayer physically for healing, healing physically, emotionally, spiritually. You know, what's interesting, as you look at the life of Jesus, all the things, all the miraculous things he did were all because of the demonic oppression of the world. People whose bodies didn't work right, he'd heal them. You can't see? I'm going to help you to see because this is what my kingdom looks like. Oh, your, your brother Lazarus is dead? I'm going to bring him back to life because death isn't supposed to be that way. He'd be healing people all the time that were, that were oppressed by the powers. We believe he still does that today. So if you want to come and just be prayed for, do that. Otherwise, let's stand and let's worship with this last song together.
that last song and uh, just know as you go maybe you don't need this reminder that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever anybody don't care who you are would believe in him you'd have everlasting life because you'd be free from the curse of the evil one and you'd be set free let's go and Let's go and by our lives set people free in the way that we love them. To show them there's another way to live. And so um, have a great day. Let's pray one last time. For those that are praying, uh, if you still want prayer after the service, feel free to come up. And we'd love to pray with you there. All right, God, we thank you for this day. Thank you for being such a great, beautiful, loving, unconditional God. Thank you that when you saw that we were your enemies... You sent your son down to die for us. Thank you that when we were entangled and dead in our sin, and there's no way of getting out of that condition, you sent your son to die for us. Thank you, Father, that all that is broken will be renewed and restored because you sent your son to die for us. Now I pray that you would help us to just partner with you as we go throughout this week and just help you. Uh, in building this kingdom, your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. We pray all this in Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. Have a great Easter. You have no rival.
Nothing can stand again. 